they would come out and visit in California. A lot more to California. They wanted to go to Disneyland and all the fun stuff. <laughs> but uh, I enjoy it here. Matter of fact, I've never been so relaxed. Growing up in California, around 10 million people, it's not very relaxing. <laughs> then I moved when my dad got sick. My father got ill in 2006. He moved to the ancestral home at 62 in 19... Uh, sorry, he moved in 1993. My grandmother got in a really bad car accident. The reason I'm telling you this is the background is important. Many of you that are here maybe live on a property you've lived on for generations or long term, 30 to 50 years longer, um, and you have family in the area. What I was shocked to find when I, when I bought the house in 2009 from my family, my brother and sister and I did, to take it over, nobody wanted to keep it. They were, they were going to sell it to strangers, and I promised my dad on his deathbed in 2007. My dad sadly passed away uh, six years ago, April 30th, 2007, just a few days ago. So um, my dad, when he, when he was dying, three days before he died, he told my brother and sister and I, don't, don't, don't sign gas leases. They're here signing uh, people with leases for $50 an acre. He said, don't do it. I didn't even know what he was talking about. I was living in Virginia at the time. I moved there in 2006 when he got sick. And then I moved up here in 2010. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he asked my sister to film it. Because what he had to say was important, I guess. So I'm watching a dying man tell us about not signing gas leases, about how if they're giving $50 an acre to the neighbors, it'll be $5,000. How did my dad know that in 2007? Because that's all they were given at the time was 50 bucks an acre. He knew something. I asked him, how do you know that stuff? He said, remember what I did for a living? I said, yeah, you were a travel agent and all over the world. Who did he take all around the world? He worked for the Western Livestock Journal. He took people that owned 10,000 acre cattle ranches from all over the Western United States on dream safaris to every place you can imagine. Australia, New Zealand, African safaris. And you know what they sat around at night and cried to him about when they were all thrown back a few? How badly they got ripped off by what? The oil and gas industry. Now, I don't care what other people tell me about. I like to experience things myself. So, there's the lease that she signed. How I got involved in this was, until I moved to the property, I had no idea about gas leases. But I went to the courthouse, which happens to be right near us in Montrose, Pennsylvania. That's the county seat. So that's probably the county is a big rectangle. Montrose is way up the corner, but I don't know why. They didn't pick a more central location. I went down to make sure that when my brother and sister and I bought this family house, that they had transferred our names on the deed and taken off my grandmother, my aunt, uncle, and other people that were listed. And they did. I found them. I also found a gas lease, Chesapeake Energy gas lease on the property. I had no idea. Here's the funny part. My dad stopped breathing on April 30th of 2007. The gas lease is from July 17th. 2007. Everyone knew my father was not interested in signing a lease. So they waited 10 weeks after he died. My uncle took the land man from Chesapeake up to the, up to the nursing home. My grandmother was 95 and a half at the time living in an assisted living facility. And they had her sign this gas lease that I had in my hand for $135.10, which was actually pretty good money, an acre. Not only did they sign up the 150 acre property, they included our one acre ancestral home property on it too. Now, I was no party to it. I had knew nothing about it. My brother, my brother lives in Mississippi. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, a hurricane hunter for 27 years. He flies perfectly to aircraft into hurricanes on purpose to do what? To save people's lives by telling them where the hurricanes are going to get. My sister lives in San Francisco. And at the time, I was in Southern California. And, you know, my dad was in the Northeast, so we're covering all four corners of the United States. That was shocking to me, and I figured there must be a mistake. No. I'll tell you what I did look up in five minutes. There's the law journal for the Yale Law Journal. I put in life tenant gas lease. And guess what it says? <laughs> a life tenant can't sign a gas lease because in Pennsylvania, natural gas is a mineral, and minerals are part of the real estate. You can't transfer real estate as a life tenant. You can only live there for the term of your natural life. Would you like to know she moved out full time from the house in 2005? She never lived there beyond 2005. So she wasn't even living in the house. But, so I thought, that'll be easy peasy. I'll just call up Chesapeake and fix it. <laughs> yeah. So there's the lease. Even more interesting is, it's the standard lease, 12.5% royalty. Who here knows the, frame, ten, the phrase 10 cents on the dollar? Yeah. 
Twelve and a half cents on the dollar is not much better, guys. <laughs> That's what they're throwing around. My dad said they're giving 50 bucks an acre. He had a saying. They're throwing nickels around like manhole covers. They're making pennies sound like some big form of, uh, of a payment. Now, here's the interesting thing. We get the end of the lease, so I buy my grandmother in the nursing home, and then there's an addendum. To this date, I can't find out who wrote that addendum, but I have some pretty good ideas. I think it's the law firm that represented my grandmother. There's a five-item addendum, and I told the person that I thought did it. I said, I'm guessing my 95 and a half year old grandma, grandmother didn't write that addendum. She never used a computer in her life. You had to write handwritten letters to her, she'd get mad. No typewriter. So, then, once they signed it, they went to record it and found out, oops, she doesn't own the property. So they had my aunt and uncle sign a ratifier. Anybody know what that is? That means they agreed to her lease. And they were signing away 40 acres of the property. If you divide 115 by 3, it's pretty close. It's 38.9 acres, I think. So they had my aunt and uncle sign ratifiers to agree to it. You know what's that piece of paper right there cost my aunt and uncle each? Because the going rate when I moved there was $6,000 an acre. Times 40, let's round it up. That's a quarter million dollars they signed away for nothing. Because that's still recorded in the county courthouse. They forgot to tell the my aunt and uncle that. Oh, by signing this piece of paper, agreeing to your mother's illegal lease, means they're signing on? You just signed away your property rights for nothing. They can't do anything about it. And they're waiting for production. And what's the date today? The date is May 2nd, 2013. So we're almost six years past when they signed this. How much production do you think going on in our area that they've gotten paid on? Can you see the big goose egg up there? That is a zero. They were waiting to get rich. Matter of fact, I know that everybody here that wants to drill in, I have no problem with somebody that is excited about having their land or something underneath it that might be worth something. The problem is, if you think they're coming anytime soon, I'm going to teach you that that is not happening, and I'll show you why it's not happening. They're not. There's my aunts. Now, even funner was when I got to the next one, I said, hey, there's another gas lease up here. Chesapeake Energy Stat Oil Hydro USA Onshore Properties from Houston, Texas. Oh, what's that? Anybody know who Stat Oil is? That's the country of Norway. That's not a company in Norway. That's a nationalized company. So a year and two months later, after they signed my grandmother, they transferred one-third ownership of all their leases in the Northeast, 1.8 million acres to Stat Oil, a foreign country, that then owned my land. Before I even knew they, Chesapeake signed it up, they sold one third. Why does that bother me? Because all I heard on the radio and the TV was America's fuel. Then why does Norway own my property, underneath my property? So they sold that for $3.375 billion. Buh, billion. Signed all my neighbors up, man. My neighbors were busy signing at 25 bucks an acre, 50, 75. We're going to be rich. Now, we know who's going to get rich. So my focus is, I'm a constitutional conservative. I'm not even a Republican. Matter of fact, anybody been to CPAC before? Any real right wing in here? That's Conservative Political Action Conference. That happens near D.C. in Maryland every year. Why they go there, I don't know, because Maryland's not a real right wing state. I'll tell you that right now. So I had the Tea Party Nation move. So anybody telling you that Craig's a uh, left wing anti growing activist, that would not be the case. What was I going there for? I went there to explain to the conservatives to get out of bed with the industry. They can sure eat them all they want, but get out of bed with them. Why? Because they're, they're going to they're gonna take it. They're going to get hit pretty hard when we find out what's really going on. Why do I say that? Because we're doing research. I tried to fix it with Chesapeake. They hung up on me. They didn't want to talk to me. I said, hey, you got an illegal lease. Take it off, and we'll negotiate, because I'm a businessman. If we got to do it, we got to do it, because if my aunt and uncle want to do it, they own two-thirds of the property, another tenant can't hold up the, prop, the, the leasing process, but at the very least, we could have done something about it. So they kept hanging up on me. I called Stat Oil. I told them, you have 48 hours to get your friends Chesapeake to call me back and fix this. I got to call the next day from Chesapeake. So Chesapeake kept still on me, so I did what I knew I had to do. Associated Press came over my house and took pictures of me and the kids on the property, and then Michael Rubicam from the uh, Allentown area wrote a 20 paragraph international release story. That's Black Friday of 2010 right there. So I moved there in January 
Ten months later, this story comes out, worldwide release. The front page of every paper in the world that will print it. There's the Shreveport, that's the one I'm most proud of the Shreveport Times. But the funny ones was, it was on all six papers front page in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, where Chesapeake's headquartered. <laughs> Boy, they called me back and wanted to talk after that. <laughs> See, no matter what side of the fence you're on with this, or even in the middle trying to learn about it, there's one thing I will not tolerate. That's not well worn in my back pocket for nothing. That's the Constitution of the United States of America. And I also like to carry around with me the Pennsylvania Constitution, which I had to learn because I wasn't a native Pennsylvanian. Well, I got to a funny page on that one. Article 1, Section 27. Very short, but it's uh, pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. Section 27, written in 1967. The people have a right to clean air pure water, and the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. How's that? Generations yet to come. As a trustee of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. When you put a statement in the Constitution that says, generations yet to come, how do you take something away from somebody who's not even born yet? It's impossible to do it legally. So I read that and I went, what is the problem here? Why are we having all these issues that nobody, that the state doesn't want to get involved in? The state has an obligation through constitutional protection to all of us to protect us from anything that might harm us. Okay? Well, some people believe there's no harm happening from the drilling. I will, I will show you some information that might make you research it a little bit more. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm going to share realities. Uh, Vera Scroggins, my good friend and neighbor, is here tonight filming us. Vera is someone that's probably a little bit further left than I am. I'm probably over here on the right. And when I moved there, I kind of thought Vera was crazy. <laughs> until I realized she's not crazy. She believes in, uh, in a safe environment for her two daughters and her grandchildren, or three children and her grand granddaughters. She lives right in my community. And I started to watch her and I thought, wow, that's the bravest, bravest person I've ever seen, standing up against this and make your voice be known. Because we all have a voice, right? There's some people their voice is, hey, don't tell me, don't you come in here from Pennsylvania and tell me what I can and can't do with my private property. I would have to say, yeah, that's, that's right. I have no right to come in and tell anybody what they can or can't do with their property. What I can tell you is, though, know, you have, Read that one, and I have the New York State Constitution too, I'm reading that one. There's some interesting stuff in there too. I'm just wondering how I, Craig Stevenson, choose to do something on my 150 acres that might negatively affect my neighbors encircling me, including further out than my next door neighbors. Where does that write in there? You will not find it in there. And that's what we're seeing happen. The person who's getting a drill bit on their property, whether theirs goes, their problems happen or not, they might not even say anything. They're waiting for the for the brake truck to roll up to the back door, right? So they might just go, mm, no, I don't see that. No, no problem. But it's the neighbors. And around me, a lot of neighbors are having problems. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I'm going to bring this up tonight. Here's Salt Springs Park. Salt Springs Park, small estate park in the state of Pennsylvania. And my dad started Friends of Salt Springs, but my grandmother was born on the property in 1912, September 23rd. And uh, she grew up with the Wheaton family, who founded Susquehanna County. She went to school in the house that has been refurbished that's on the property. Why am I bringing that up? Because in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you who the DEP is blaming for the problems in our area with the water quality. And it's not a person. So I've covered my family uh, and where they came from, why I'm here. I'm here to talk to you about what's really happening, because education is key. Now, let's get into a couple things like America's fuel. Um, America's fuel sounds really good to me because I'm, you know, Mr. Strong American guy, and I love, you know, my, my dad was 63 years in Civil Air Patrol, and guess what he specialized in? Emergency management. Okay, that's interesting. And uh, his job was to make sure Bad things don't happen, and if they did, figure out how to stop them from happening again. That's what he did forever. When he raised in Southern California, I thought he was a nut job. We had to have 100 gallons of water, 
food, flashlights, radio equipment. I mean, we, we, I'm thinking, what are we doing? We survive the, the, uh, the uh, bomb last year? Pretty much, yeah. So what my concern was when I moved here, I've got a lease on my property, so I fixed it. Guess how much Chesapeake begged me to take their money for after telling me for six months to go pound sand? Not $135.10. I couldn't get them to remove the lease. They refused to do it. They said they would fight me in court. They would not do it. And the lawyers told me it would cost me fifty to hundred thousand bucks to fight them to remove it. So I made them pay me for my brother and sister and I's one third. Four thousand dollars an acre. Oh, that's a little bigger than my neighbors still in Shelby Pew, who have the closest gas hole to me. They got seventy-five bucks an acre. Grandma got 135 ten. They told me flat out they don't have any money, they're broke, and they're not leasing. I said, you're going to pay me or take the lease off. If you don't pay me, I'm going to sue you for $10 million. And so they, they did that. My grandmother's lease was 4.5%. They called it a one-eighth royalty. And I know here is the minimum in New York State. So we share some things here. What we don't share is we have Kevin to help real estate in Pennsylvania. You don't. Since 2005, you have what's called compulsory integration. What it used to be called is forced pooling, but that sounds a little bit too much like to do something. So they call it compulsory integration, that sounds much better. It's like what they call it, um, eminent domain in Pennsylvania, the drilling companies call it uh, certificate of public convenience. <laughs> like I said, you're talking about eminent domain? No, we prefer to call it certificate of public convenience. Yeah, thank you. Now, who here, who here has a lease on the property? Who here has a lease with Chesapeake? Anybody? The reason I mention that is, it doesn't matter who signed you. Because you know, you sit down with the guy, and you might even research all of them and go, this is the best company. They're not having any problems. So I'm going to sign with them. No, you didn't. You signed with them first. Anybody see the news? Chesapeake just sold 182,000 acres in northeastern Pennsylvania of leases to Southwestern for $93 million. You know what the average was for the price per acre? $574. They just paid me four grand an acre two, two years ago. They took a little bit of a bath on that, huh? Why did that happen? Well, why that happened was because they are using this like some kind of giant money-making scheme. You'll notice that. You'll have a no-name, you never heard of a company signing leases, signing people up. They're not signing people up. Because my question would be, are you drilling the holes? Well, oh man, no. They're going to sign you up, and give you your grand acre or two grand, and then they're going to hold it until some company comes in and they're going to flip it to them. And that group that paid you that money is going to make two or three times their money back. Just like that. It's like houses. I mean, there was a time when you could build a house or buy one for 10,000 bucks and pay it off in five or 10 years. And the next thing you know, it rose with inflation and you don't like that. Well, the same thing's happening with the, with the leases. The, uh, here's my pipeline easement. That's another funny one. So when I moved there, besides finding the gas leaks, I went up to my property, there were stakes across it. And my friend told me, oh yeah, the pipeline's coming. <laughs> really? I didn't know anything about it. Well, they already staked out your property without my permission, by the way, to leave my door. So I called up the company and I found out my aunt and uncle Benjamin had they signed a pipeline agreement already. Forgot to mention to the, the other three people that owned the property with them. And then uh, my grandmother, they went to sign my grandmother in 2010, two weeks before she died, but she was nearly in a coma, so they had to have her younger sister sign as power of attorney. That's how it, huh, wait a minute, you really need to go bother my family while my grandmother's dying, you have to sign a pipeline agreement? So my brother and sister and I were the holdouts, but at least this time, the pipeline company decided they better get all the needed owners on a document before they start doing anything, right? So I went down to Montrose and met with the, it's called Laser Midstream, it's the company, and I went down and met with them. Four big guys, and they said, y'all, every one of them, they're all from Louisiana. So I went in, and they were all excited to see me. Come on down, let's talk, it'd be great. So I stood in front of them, and they said, we're glad you're here, we need your brother and sister and yourself to sign this agreement so we can get this pipeline built and get the gas to market and make you guys all rich, you and your neighbors rich. I said, awesome, let's talk. And they said, we're offering $5 a foot and a lifetime easement. 
And I literally went like this. I got four big guys standing there. We're in the room. Doors closed. I went like this and said, is there a camera here? Am I supposed to be laughing right now? And they said, that's what we gave all your neighbors, Mr. Stevens. And I said, well, you're not looking at my neighbors. You're looking at me. <laughs> then they said, well, all your neighbors have all signed. You're one of the only holdouts. You're holding everything up. And I'm sure they're not very happy about it. I said, that's funny. I called one of my neighbors last night before I came here. And here's the names of the five miles to the west of the neighbors who said they'd never sign an agreement with you. So I laid the card down. I said, now I'm wondering who's lying. I'm guessing it's not the people I called last night. So I don't like liars. I told them, I don't do business with liars. And then they went like this all at the same time. These guys are all about six, three or more. They crossed their arms and they said, that's OK. The state of Pennsylvania wants us here. They're going to give us what? Certificate of Public Convenience. I said, you mean eminent domain? So I said, let me recap our conversation here this evening. First, you want to give me five bucks a foot and a lifetime easement, which has never happened on the property. There's no lifetime anything for you. Number two is your liars, and I don't like that. So that's a big strike against you. And number three, I don't know how they do things in Louisiana, boys. But you come here start talking about taking my property by force of the state, and we're going to have a severe, severe problem. He said, so let me tell you how to do the word now. Not another person sets foot on my property unless you have my permission. I'm the only one that lives here. The other four owners live all across the rest of the United States at the boundaries. So the only one you're going to have to worry about is me and my Mossberg at the front of the property. Stay off. Uh-oh. So that was five bucks a foot. That's all they're ever going to give, they told me. Whoever heard that one? That's all we can give you. If we leave, we're going. We're not going to offer you anything anymore. Two months later, they called me. They offered 50 bucks a foot on a lifetime easement. Went up three times. I said, no, thank you. No lifetime easement. You know what it became? When they finally did a negotiated deal with a landowner's group, $115 a foot on a 40-year easement. That's a little different. My aunt and uncle signed in January, we're waiting for a $5,000 check each. We're going to get $15,000 total dollars. We got $285,000 over 40, or 40 years. Why am I mentioning the money? Because that's what we're all about, right? We all want our money. I want my money from what's underneath my property. Well, I carry another thing around with me all the time. If you've seen me speak before, New Testament. <laughs> I'm not a real Bible thumper. My grandmother went to church every day of her life, and everything was about. You know, there were some more pictures of Jesus on our, up in her house, which is fine with me. But then if you went to church, it was an interesting place. I love my grandmother. She's a great person. But I start, I've read this a few times myself, and there's nothing I can find in here about doing. I think that the golden rule is doing to others as you have done to yourself. But I know in here, if you find the passages about money, they don't end very well. If all you're doing is worrying about money in your life. Having some money and making a living and improving your way of life is fine. But if it's at the cost of others, that's not how I would raise to do it. We all, as a community, should be rising together. Even helping the people who are less fortunate who have had problems. That's what I was, and I was born in California and raised in California, so get, get that. I learned that out there in a crazy left-wing liberal land. So, we are... Uh, we're talking about the leasing and the way, and who we can believe. Well, anybody here who does, who does the PR, public relations work for the gas industry nationally? They're called Hill and Knowlton, look them up. H-I-L-L and K-N-O-W, like no, L-T-O-N, Knowlton. Just look them up. You know what they did for the last 60 years? They're the, one that, the ones that ran the great ads and that smoking is good for you, healthy, and will make you popular. And having lost my mom to smoking-related illness after 50 years of smoking, I'll tell you, that doesn't sit very well with you. What I found out when I researched Silicon Mold was that's who companies go to when their PR, when their, when their name is in the toilet. The tobacco industry was in big trouble and Bill and Mold and helped them turn it around. And the drilling industry was getting into some trouble while the problems were popping up. They were playing like whack and whack and ball to Chuck E. Cheese. Problems, bang, bang, bang. They were too busy banging the problems down. So they went and got somebody that, what did they do? 
Well, when you watch the commercials, you would never know there's a problem. Now, in all fairness, because I love driving cars, I love flying airplanes, I, I don't mind using oil or natural gas. It's not a real issue with me, except for if it's not safe to get out of the ground without harming somebody or a community, that's where it gets a little sticky there. So my focus was, can this be done safely, and why would they not take responsibility for problems? Because that, to me, I don't care how good somebody is if everything's going right. We all really learn in life when things go wrong, correct? So the key is, how are you going to take care of me when it all goes south? That's what I judge somebody by. You're going to hear about the roads. Well, let me tell you, Veer and I were honored to have three of your state sitting senators come last Friday and go for a little tour. David Carlucci, the head of the IDC, or one of them. Uh, we had Cecilia Katchik, brand new. She's from the Albany area. And we had Senator Bill Perkins from Harlem. It was very interesting. We had a woman, we had a man, and we had a black senator who's from Harlem, so from New York City area. They came last Friday, and we toured them from 11 a.m. till 3. Word got out they were coming, so when we showed up at Salt Springs Park to start the tour, there was energy and death right there. <laughs> Waiting for us. <laughs> Which we're used to. You're not used to that. We gave the tour to Yoko Ono and Sean Lennon, too, if you didn't know that. And Susan Sarandon tagged along. And I got um, your neighbor from Rochester, Arun Gandhi, the grandson of Gandhi. Did anybody here know that, that uh, the Gandhi family, uh, the, the guy that's basically doing all Gandhi's work, lives in Rochester. He's a United States citizen, and he's also a citizen of the state of New York. So don't call him a nymph because he lives right here too. So he came because I went and met him when I spoke in Bath and awoke in Auburn last year to talk to people. Um, I stayed at a, at a place called Thunder Mountain, which is right above Bath, called the Peace Beavers. They're like the Peace Family. Here it is. So when I was there, they offered me a chance to go visit and meet Gandhi in Rochester. So I went. Pretty famous guy, his grandfather. I brought that. There's another one the industry is attacking pretty viciously. If you want to find out if there's any problems going on with the drilling industry in the United States, Google the list of the harm. What is it? Well, it's not a bunch of made up stories. There's a lady named Jenny Lysak. She's now a real good friend of Vera Nye's. She's from Western PA. All she does is Google all over the United States and find stories that are already in newspaper accounts. This is not, this isn't somebody telling a story. This is newspaper, and she has links to videos when they do uh, a news story with camera. 1,200 names on it from 40 different states. You know what I noticed when you read through this? If you don't have to cut it out, you can just look at it. Every story is almost identical. They started drilling nearby. And my water turned into Coca-Cola, black with bubbles in it. And then the methane went up. How did I know? Boy, I was getting dizzy in the shower. And then there were some problems with bubbling. And then the water doesn't make it black anymore. After a few days, it goes dark brown. And then it usually swirls around. It's just interesting. But same story. From Alaska to Pennsylvania to Louisiana to Colorado. It has nothing to do with what we're being told, which is, Oh, where we were three years ago, I moved there. Oh, it's the geology. You guys have crazy geology here. Hey, but you came here to drill holes in the ground, so what are you blaming the geology for? Why don't you just figure out how to do it? And if you can't do it without doing damage, see you later. I mean, that's my thought. Is that's 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 fair. So I wasn't beating the drum against the industry until they started doing that kind of stuff. Wanted to, wanted to take my land by eminent domain and put pipe I had to go speak at the Public Utility here, uh, Commission hearings because they tried to get that certificate of public convenience so they could do what? Make us take a lifetime easement with five bucks a foot. Not negotiate with us. They were, oh, we want to negotiate. And in the back room deal, trying to get eminent domain. Why am I mentioning that? Anybody here heard of the Constitution Pipeline? It goes from Brooklyn, PA, if you didn't know there's a Brooklyn, Pennsylvania, it's right near where Vera and I live, it's about 15 miles away. There's Brooklyn, Pennsylvania, up to the state line, 
to Albany, 122 miles. It's a 30-inch transmission line connecting. Right here is the Iroquois and the uh, Iroquois and the Tennessee connect right there. Then it will split. They go to either Boston or Long Island. That's where the two big ones go from there. Why am I showing you that? Well, Vera and I found out about it earlier because Vera is a real big pipeline fighter. She didn't like the pipeline they were putting across my property at all. And she fought it and held them off for about a year. They went from spending $65 million to put it in to $150 million. Okay? So they weren't happy about that. But you know when they were happy? Three days after they finished installing it and started running gas through it, guess how much they sold it to, to Williams? $750 million. Originally, when I didn't like the deal they gave me, I finally I stopped arguing with them. I said, okay, I'll do it. My, my family's decided we will we'll let you on. You put the pipeline in. We don't even care about the money, really. I just want two valves, one on each end of my property. And I want to have the key to it. And I want you to pay me 0.01% of the money that flows through that pipeline. And the guy went out to me and goes, no, you'd be making more than the CEO of the company. What? Really? In other words, once those pipelines are forced to cross your property or put in, they're making billions of dollars sitting that gas outbound. That's just easy to figure out. That's a FERC line, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. When FERC gets involved, when the federal government, we're from the federal government, we're here to help, right? The black suit with the machine gun. Okay, what does that mean, FERC? Well, that means you guys would be considered class one rural, or the length of it here. Up here, class one rural means less than 10 structures per square mile within the range of the pipeline, within a 220 yard radius on either side. Then your class one rural, which means, guess how much oversight there is on anything that's done, whether it's a pipeline or a compressor station? That would be zero. The company that installs it takes care of it. And if it blows up, well, that will never happen. <laughs> well, sometimes they have kind of interesting. They're, they're really good at their own PR, but they will stand right in front of you, and their CEO will, and I'll show these afterwards, but. <laughs> This is the 2012 Hazard Mitigation Plan for Susquehanna County. Vera and I were at a county commissioner's meeting, and they passed this. We go, what is that? So we went over to the guy that runs the emergency management, and he said, oh, let's try to give this book and let us look at it. We say, we have a copy. Not yet, but we got one that went online. It's like 200 and some pages long, but I only printed out the stuff this, that's pertaining to the gas industry. Look at that. Now, Five years ago, there was nothing from the 2007 one, zero. I'll move it a little bit closer so you can see it. There's the Lake Compressor Station in Springville, which is right next to Demick. About a year and a half ago, it went kaboom. Blew the roof, all, part of the roof off and two of the walls out. But they will tell you, these, put it right next to the school. 20 inch pipeline, we're going right underneath the school playground. Right there. There's no problem. Whatever you do, don't Google pipeline accidents in the United States in the 20, 20th century. That's about that thick when you cut it out. And then the fun one to do is the most recent pipeline accidents in the United States in the 21st century. That's the last 13 years now, right? There's over 352 entries in that one. From simple things to kaboom. When a pipeline blows up, anybody see the video on the West Virginia one that blew up? This old, this lab, um, I think that was just a few months ago. And when it blew up, it was a 10-inch line. I think. And, it, and it broke open and lit on fire. And the picture was a flamethrower shooting across the road, two-lane two -lane highway, two-lane highway, in opposite directions the big ditch in the middle so you can't cross over. Well, the flamethrower burned for, I don't know, four or six hours before they could turn the knobs and turn it off. And if you Google that, 700 foot sections of the asphalt on both sides fell right off, they melted, fell right off the road. Burned to 12 to 1400 degrees. There were four houses in the way. Now if you look at the houses, anybody ever seen a house that burned? Regular house fire? Well, you'll have a structure, metal structure left of the 
refrigerator and the bed frame. And can't melt that. You have to get really hot to do that. Look at the pictures of the houses from the West Virginia pipeline explosion. They burnt to carbon dust. Everything. Nothing was there. Brick was burned down. Everything was burned down. The vehicle gets in the way, melts it right to the ground, incinerates it. And they are putting literally thousands upon thousands of miles of these pipelines all through our community where we are. Well, why would you build a 122 mile pipeline from the gas fields of northeast of Pennsylvania that attaches in Albany and then goes to two harbors, Boston Harbor and Long Island? Can you imagine? Why would they be doing that? I wonder. And why would they need to take my land and do it? Because that's 122 miles. You know how much they set aside to give the landowners on the whole 122 miles? $750,000. Divided by 122 miles per foot. It's around three dollars a foot. That's right around the five bucks a foot they tried to rip all the bus off with. Only they can do it because they'll get in the domain. Now, when the FERC gives a pipeline right of way and they use eminent domain, guess what the setback is on the 30 inch high pressure lines? Uh, none. If they like that route, it's best to go right underneath your house and your barn. They just bore it and even put a 30 inch high pressure gas line right underneath the foundation of your house and you get to say nothing. Now, have you seen the people down in uh, Texas fight the Keystone XL pipeline? That lady, the old lady standing there with a shotgun on her property. You're not getting on the property because I said no. You're not taking it from me. And then what they do? You're now a domestic terrorist. You're not even getting your rights from you. Because you stand in the way of, of a infrastructure pipeline. What? That's the game, folks. So that's on board right now. There was one called the Commonwealth Pipeline. That was going from us south. That got put on hold. You know why? Anybody seen the price of natural gas? recently. It's in what we call the toilet. Hovering three dollars and three dollars and fifty cents. Four years ago it was about sixteen bucks a thousand. Between twelve and sixteen it reflected it. It was getting up high there. So when people were getting royalty checks they were doing pretty good even if they were only getting twelve and a half percent. Now there's nothing. So little that they dropped the, they put the pipeline on the shelf because nobody is investing in natural dry natural gas right now. Pipelines no. How do I know that? Anybody see the National Geographic for March? See that in front? The promise and risk of fracking. It's not, it's not Pennsylvania. It's not New York. It's North Dakota. What are they showing us in North Dakota? Well, it's 32 pages. Ten of them were text. It's not hard to see that. That's 20,000 plus dots in North Dakota. Oil wells. Oil price is up pretty good. What's in the way? The methane. What are they doing with it? Lighting it on fire and burning it. Why would you want them to rush here, guys? I don't care if you're for this or not. Why would you want them to rush here right now? If this was a gold mine on your property, wouldn't you want to take it when it's 2,000 bucks an ounce instead of 200? Yes, I mean, come on. If it's about making money, because that's what I hear, everybody, you're holding me up for making my money. Maybe we're cautioning you to not let somebody in and take it when it's this low. Because they're going to make plenty of money reselling it, reselling it, reselling it. But we get landowners paid on that low head price. And who do you think drove that price down to $3 a thousand? It wasn't you, the landowner. It was the industry themselves. They overproduced. So for some reason, it's like crack addicts. They don't want to trim the valve off and wait for the price to go back up. So it's good for everybody. But what are they doing with that low price? They're enticing everybody and their brother to switch over their cars and their buses and heat your buildings and let's just get this stuff going. It's going to be great. Hold on. It's low price right now. I was born in the 60s. I'm sure there were some people here who were born in the 60s, maybe a little bit before and some after. But in the 60s, the, when I started going to junior high, people were into drugs. <laughs> and they used to give you some, I never got into it, because I would get in big trouble with my parents, but they'd give you a little taste or two until you got where you really liked it, and then it started costing you money. So my problem is, when it's three bucks a thousand, and it costs a buck fifty less to run your car on it than gasoline right now, that's good when it's down here. 
Anybody make a guess where this gas is going from this 122 mile pipeline that's going to harbors? You know what we found out when Veer and I and the teams have looked at the pipelines? Every one of these pipelines are heading for some kind of place, some port where they can do something with it. And let's see if I've got it right here. I have a document here that shows where it is going. Here it is. Just Google uh, applications received by the Department of Energy for export of LNG, liquefied natural gas, lower 48 states. There's 22 LNG plants listed on that. 22. Right now, today. I just found out about one in, in uh, Long Beach, New York, too. But they're saying it's inbound. So I called the people up and said, inbound? I said, they're not doing anything inbound. Nobody's bringing natural gas in. The guy said, yeah, we're fighting it because we found out. They're claiming it's an inbound, so they're going to build They want to build it. And then, because it's a deep water port, they're not under the same restrictions as a shallow port. So what they need to do is once they build it and it's inbound, they're going to go, those darn contractors, they made it come in instead of out, like we thought they were going to build. So then they just ask the Department of Energy for a note from their teacher, and they can give them a pop, give them a permit to outbound just like that. Who's playing a game here, guys? <laughs> During the Olympics, I watched the Olympics. I, I, I swam and played water polo in high school. I was a champion runner and swimmer in Southern California. Amen. So I really like to compete. I love to compete. And I, love, I don't mind losing, but I like to win a lot better. So I got real good at what I was doing. But they're gonna, the commercials were saying America's natural gas. Drew, you know what I do now? If you say drill a well, bring a soldier home in front of me, stand back. Because that is an insult to the soldiers that are fighting right now. That's a complete insult. You're not drilling a well and bringing a soldier home. When, who are the top five buyers that want to buy our natural gas? China, India, Russia, Norway, and Japan. A couple, two or three of those aren't on our, they're on the naughty list, not the nice list, right? I don't want to hear where we're sending it all overseas. Number one, if they do allow it to come to my neighborhood like they've done, that stuff better stay right here. You know how we won the Public Utility Commission hearing? We won. They didn't get it. You know why? I stood right in front of the two CEOs of the pipeline company and I said to them, hey, i got a question for you. Read the Constitution. I think it's the Fifth Amendment, if I'm clear, about public takings clause. And it says, to take my property, you have to give just compensation. It said, without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay. So, I asked them, when you put this pipeline in, because I'm on heating oil for my heating for my old house. So when you put this in right behind my house, are you going to run a pipe down to every one of the homes and businesses nearby to make sure we're getting this? good local low-cost natural gas coming out from underneath our ground. Both the CEOs that went, what's the deal? Where's the beef, man? You're going to come here and do the drilling. You're going to put my neighborhood at risk when you drill because, hey, who here's ever seen industrial activity? I grew up in Southern California. But we weren't stupid enough. We put our industrial zones over here where the rail yards were, and we didn't put it where the schools, churches, and homes were. We put it way over there, in case there was a kaboom, or a leak, or a spill. It was way over there. It wasn't right here. Where do you think they're drilling holes? Well, I got a map here of our area. Vera, Vera looked it up. We found it from the Rose Conservancy. It shows what they're going to do to our area. Here it is. Kind of right here in front. Sixteen well pads in Silver Lake Township alone. Demick is right nearby. How many wells there? 180? 160 million. 160 wells in just a small area. And there's a nine square mile no drill that's been in effect for four years now. They can't even put any new ones in there. We'd probably be over 200 if they could. So there's there's the future line. They're already clearing these pads. They put them in near Vera. The closest to me is the DePew family. They're a mile. Uh, east of me. Anybody see the movie Truthland? 
You can look it up on the internet. That's my neighbor Shelly, the pew. They're the new kids on the block. Phil's, her husband's family's been there since the 1890s. My family's been in town since the, since the 1830s. There's Shelly, Truthland. The problem with the movie was when I watched it, because we were all excited, oh, we got a local, we a movie. For some reason, Shelly drove all around the country, couldn't find one single problem with gas bill from anybody. Maybe she should have driven like a mile down the street to Franklin Forks, which is two and a half miles from my house, and asked the Manning family or the Hadley family or Scott Henry, whose water went black and the methane went up in December 6 of 2011. Right here. 2011. That's 15 months ago, almost 16 months. So we wondered why Shelby would do that. And then if you watch the movie, I recommend people watch some of these because Vera and I get a bowl of popcorn and start, but we almost choke on the popcorn. Right? It's just ridiculous. If you're going to teach me something, I want to know all of it. I don't want to know the part you want to teach me. I don't want to be indoctrinated. I want to be educated. When I went to school back in the Stone Age, as my kids would say, but you know, back in the 60s and the 30s, 70s, you got to challenge the teacher. Even in, I did in junior high school, in high school, in college. You go to, if you're all above college age, but you want to go take a class, go take one in college now. And try to challenge the professor uh -huh. once. And then they go, would you like to even have a passing grade in this class? Then shut up and sit down. Because I'm not interested in your opinion. If I want it, I'll be in front of you. Got it? There's, we're not educating anybody anymore. How I was raised was, if I read a thousand books on a subject and my professor read, read, read 50, or maybe even wrote one, I might come up with something that he didn't even think about or knew about, because he can't know everything, no matter how good you are at something. Always want to be learning. Well, Shelley didn't teach us much. What she told us was, well, cases can't fail. They can't fail. Shout out to my buddy Ray Kimball, who lives 482 feet in front of his front door, is a well called the Costello One. And his water turned into that almost five years ago, four and a half years ago. Okay, that's from December last year. It's even worse now. And now they've had a maintenance rate in front of his house for 10 straight weeks working on something, but they won't tell us what it is. <laughs> what, what are you working on? Nothing, just clearing up a little. You've had it there for 10 weeks. Halliburton showed up. You know how much Halliburton charges to show up at your well pad when you need them? A million dollar bill to show up. And you know what they do? You get paid in advance. You know why? What do you think Chesapeake's selling all these properties for now? Why are they doing it? No money. They're paying net six months, net 180, to the contractors. Mm -hmm. The reason I brought that up was because now, uh, anybody, anybody here go to church on a regular basis? No? So the reason I asked that was if you're in a community and you like go to school with everybody, or your kids do, church, you have this community, and you all have parties and picnics and Fourth of July parties and everything else. Well, Demick is 15 miles from me, and when I moved to Silver Lake Township and found out about Gasper and wanted to know more about it, I heard about Demick and all my neighbors said, oh, they're lying over there. They're just lying. They're, they're lying and they want to get money. They want to sue the companies and get a big lawsuit settlement by an island of bombs. I said, oh, okay. So we're like, go oh, straight over there and met every single person on there. Vera, Vera was there well before me and met everybody. I met him and I went, mm, nah, I don't want any water. And for anybody that wants to see, I've got the test results here from their water. They've had the water tested many times. Not very good. Really bad, actually. Barium, strontium, radium, lithium, all the eums. Right? If it ends in IUM, UM, you don't want it. I always ask people that want to, oh, I'll put a filter on it. That'll clean it up. What is the recommended daily allowance for uh, barium in my baby's formula, in my, um, for, for the formula in my baby bottle for my child? Ooh, that would be for me. I have four children. I have four kids. They'll be the seventh generation owners of my property. And I'm not interested in having any EMs in their liquid that they intake. So you'll hear about everybody's lying, and uh, we're all just lying to everybody about these problems. We're just trying to trying to make them bigger than they really are because we're trying to scare people away because we're anti's. I'm not anti-enemy, guys. 
I'm pro drinking clean water, breathing clean air, and having <coughs> soil that the five generations that lived on that property before me passed me nice and clean and fertile so I could actually grow something if I needed to. And I'm not a farmer. I was raised in California. I was more like a surfer. <laughs> right? So I'm living on this beautiful property. I could grow whatever I want. And I may, in the future, once I stop having to talk to everybody about what might be coming, which I'm not going to stop until people wake up. I want the right-wing people that want this so bad to explain to me how their rights don't end at their property line. A very famous Chief, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court said, my right to throw a punch ends at your nose. I can throw my... It's like uh, Veer and I, on uh, July 29th of 2011, my kids come and stay for a week at a time with me in the summer. Week on week off, they love the property. Bear, turkeys, deer, fox running everywhere. It's just amazing. Nothing I grew up with. I grew up in the city. And uh, they would go to the back of my property. My little one acre has a creek called Laurel Lake Creek. Here lives Laurel Lake, right up, on, up from me a few miles. And then it comes right down behind my house. And my kids, I would give them a piece of bread. In the morning, they go out and tear off little chunks and throw it in the creek right off the, right off the bank. And the, the little shads and the little trout would just attack like crawdads. They loved it. The water would swirl. Really fun. And they enjoy it. They're, they're like 10 and 8. So we're there. And they're throwing this stuff in. We're having fun. So we got, got to go to town, do whatever. We'll come back. So we go into town for a few hours. We come back. I give the kids their bread. I put the truck in the garage. And they come. I go walk out with my piece of bread. And they're walking back like this bread in the hand. I go, what's going on? He said, the creek's all full of mud. What do you mean the creek's all full of mud? So I went there. This was a crystal clear trout stream in my backyard. Would now look like the Mississippi River. What happened? Well, behind my house, my neighbor, they were boring underneath to put the pipeline in that was going on our property by the way that we were told, eh, easy, easy peasy, don't worry about it. So they're boring from a high point underneath the creek, which happens to have the township road right next to it, and then they're coming up to pop it up over here. And they're about 30 or 40 feet under the ground level to do that. So they can drag the pipe underneath and they're all good. So we, and they use drilling mud. Okay? Hmm. And it's, it's the bent night clay. And they'll tell you, what's well, the same stuff you get when you go to the health food store or to a spa and they rub it all over you? No, it's not. Google it. The drilling mud they make with barium or or other things to make different, it gives it different viscosity and different ways that it handles what they're doing. So they're going underneath, going underneath, going underneath, they get to the bottom. Anybody know physics here? You start putting a lot of liquid in up here and putting it down, and then you try to push it uphill, oh, something's going to give. And guess where it did? Right in the middle. It blew a 10 foot diameter hole right through the bottom of that creek. Just like a geyser. And that mud, now, you can't take the mud back. It's going, you know, 150 yards down and then go like this, and all of a sudden, when that hole comes, it's got to drain out. They're like, uh oh, Houston, we've got a problem. So they start throwing sandbags in around it to contain it, but it's just going like this. So then they bring these giant vacuum trucks in. They hold about 5,000 gallons, and they, they're a vacuum truck. So they back up, back, they're zooming these trucks. All of a sudden, the trucks are flying down the road. It's a little dirt road, not even wide enough for two cars to be side by side. They're zooming up this road. So my son and I, my, my boys and I go down there, and we're like watching like this, and I go, what's going on? And the guy goes, hey, man, we can't park right now. We have a blowout. And uh, we're just trying, we're, getting under, we're getting under control. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. OK. I go, well, my creek's all full of blood. Oh, no, sorry. And then I go back, and I call the DB, and I say, Hey, this is Craig Stevens at you know my address, and I go, uh, I go. The, the guys down the street had a blowout in the creek, putting the pipeline in, and the lady from the DP goes, Mr. Stevens, we don't call that a blowout. We call that an inadvertent return to surface. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was laughing. Well, I'm gonna have an involuntary muscle reaction in somebody's face down here, unless you get somebody down here and stop it right now. Oh, now Mr. Stevens, don't. So, that was on July 29th. You come up and look at this later. There's a mud truck, 5,000 gallons, laying on its side. So, two of the trucks took off from filling up. 
And they went up the road and went to Laurel Lake Road, and then it comes down on a steep hill to a stop sign to 29. Go that way to Montrose, go that way to the state line. And it's a blind intersection, so the first guy, okay, all clear, makes his turn. There's my friend John Jones, our neighbor, John Jones, with his Subaru Legacy sitting right there. This guy is stopped, turns that truck, he's cool. The guy behind him, what they do is, when it's clear, they call him and say, it's clear. He never touched the brakes. <laughs> he comes down that hill, makes the turn, uh-oh, there's John Jones' Subaru sitting right there, and he's got a 17-year-old daughter sitting right next to him. Well, he hits the brakes on a downhill turning. Boom. You'll notice that the truck has crushed the half the car John was sitting in. It crushed his body right into the vehicle. Cut him right in half. Left him alive. He lived for more than five minutes after that. While his daughter Allison opened the passenger door and got out with very minor injuries and watched her dad spend the last five minutes telling her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was just waiting. I wanted to be safe. I didn't want to go up there when I knew the trucks were coming down. I was just trying to keep us safe. She was actually pulling pieces of stuff out of him, trying to help him. And of course, when he passed away at the scene, she thought it was her fault. And the EMAs said, honey, we couldn't have saved him. Could not have saved him. Because once we opened the car up for him, he was only, and he's only half a person, there would have been no way to save him. We're going to take the whole car to the, you know, and we can't take cars with people hanging out of them down the road. So there's John Jones. So don't let anybody ever tell you that the traffic related to the industry working in your area can't hurt anybody. Ask Mrs. Jones and her two beautiful daughters that lost their 56-year-old, her 56-year-old husband. Why? Oh. When they checked the truck, it only had one functioning brake. That was the driver's side front brake. The passenger side the front brake and the two rears were, were caged. They wouldn't even work. And he had what? No commercial driver's license. And was from where? Texas, so when he got out of the hospital, guess where he is now? Hiding. After killing our neighbor. And because it's a death related. Now, around us, they don't even tell you. That is just, that's just an accident when it's reported. They don't call that related to any kind of drilling activity or anything. We don't do that in Pennsylvania. We just say it's an accident. Somebody died. <laughs> what was it? Well, never mind. You don't have to worry about that. So the key is. We're told a lot of things, like it's safe, and we've been doing it for how many years, guys? Everyone knows that drill? 70 plus years? No, they haven't. The process they're doing in northeastern Pennsylvania, maybe six or seven. That's it. Not 70 years. Another lie. I'm thinking to myself, because I'm in PR and marketing. I, mean, I have a marketing company, and I help make really cool products, and I match them with people who need them. And then the person in the middle that makes them pays me pretty good money to put the two together, like a dating service or stuff, right? So I get paid from that. So I like to market the only things, I have to totally believe in something if I'm going to market it. I'm here talking to you tonight about the negatives of this because I picked a side. Originally I didn't. I was in the education one. Now I picked a side. I'm going with the truth tellers. I'm not going with liars. I'm going with the truth tellers. Did you hear me? I'm going with my neighbors. I'm standing with my neighbors. I'm not standing with the guys from around the $1,000 bills. Why? Because they disgust me. And here's why. Demick. Demick first water first went bad on September 11, 2008. When the fire alarm really went on was with Norma Fiorentino's well cake, the, the top of her water well casing, six inch thick concrete slab on January 1st of 2012, sorry, 2009, blew right off. Because her pump kicked on and there was so much methane, it ignited it and it blew up. And that caused a whole frenzy. It wasn't because somebody called my water's bad and I want to get rich soon the gas industry that's going in the area. They showed up, emergency, because the thing it blew the thing into chunks and pieces, right? So they show up. It took. Now, the state, I have all the documents after we're done, we're doing question and answer. Did you know there's three consent orders signed by the CEO of Cabot Oil and Gas? Three, not one. There's one in 2009, April 15th. One in 2009 on, let's see, no, sorry, April, the 2009 was in November, I believe. Then the 
April 15, 2010 was the first consent order signed by Dan and Jesus CEO. We did it. We're not going to argue it. And then they signed again on December 15. They did it. I have the document says they won't argue with the validity of this document in court law or in public. They won't do it. So when you hear somebody say, Debbie is a bunch of bum, why didn't the guy that owns the corporation from Houston, Texas sign a document and right underneath his name is who? Kevin Cunningham, the chief legal counsel for the entire corporation, signed it. You rarely get the chief lawyer of an entire corporation to sign anything unless they mean it. You're not going to be able to hold a gun to Dan Gingy's head if he was in a room by himself, but you're not going to be able to do that to his chief legal counsel, the two of them sitting right together. Why am I saying that? Because the state found him guilty. The state, when I, when, when I found out about him, I got involved. Cabot's answer was we didn't do it. But one thing they did do is, if you called and said my water was black, they got a water buffalo over to you right away. And who knows what a water buffalo is? It's a big cattle tank. You know, drive around. We saw them drive along the road out here in front of the farms. 550 or 1100 gallon container. They hooked, they plumbed it into the house, separated the water well from the house because of the methane coming up in it, and they would started delivering water. You know how much the water cost to deliver per day? They had it paid for hundred dollars a day per home. Anybody here got a spare three grand a month to get water, clean water to your family while you're waiting to find out for a couple of years? <coughs> If the drilling company that was drilling in the area when your water changed uh, did it or not? I don't know. I don't So Cabot paid for that delivered water for two and a half years. That's about one and a half million dollars. You know how much the fines were from DEP? A million dollars. And they paid it. And you know how much they paid in the settlement agreement? And they made last year they got everybody to sign non disclosure agreement. After the EPA came in, everybody in the back. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So we added it up. Four and a half million, or four one half million dollar settlement, million and a half dollars in water delivery, and a million dollar fine. We're approaching seven million bucks there. That's before all the ancillary other stuff goes on. I'm thinking they're way up to 10 or 12 million dollars, easy, maybe more. So when they signed these consent orders and the cabinet refused to do anything with it, they said, yeah, we didn't really mean it. So the people from Dimmick went, and John Hanger, our secretary, our, um, DP secretary, he was on PennBest board, which gives infrastructure projects money. So he had them all come there and state their case. And you know what they did, miraculously? They passed 11 to 2, a $12 million forgivable loan to build a water pipeline to get these people clean water. They've been living with bad water for two and a half years. The state and the drilling company are arguing about it. So they said, we'll just give you the money and build it, and then we'll sue Cabot for it if, they, if we determine that they're guilty and we, we find them. Okay, that would be a permanent fix, because without that, who knows what you have to have to have a house you can live in or a business you can run? Water, sewer, power. Without any one of those three, you're condemned. And I'll live there legally. So we thought we had it fixed. We all went, yay, hey, they gave me 12 million. And then what happened? Well, we got, if I got it right here, a group called Enough Already was formed, who basically said they were going to sue the gas industry, or sorry, sue the DEP, if they tried to force their friends, Cabot, to pay for the uh, water line that would fix the problem. Now there's nothing like living in a neighborhood, in a community, where you drive down the road to get to your house where you have contaminated water, and the state has found the company guilty that's done it, and they're refusing to acknowledge you, and then your neighbors have signs on their lawn that say, enough already, no water pipeline for you. No kidding. And look at these signs, four color, double sided signs. And no little tiny group from Denver, Pennsylvania paid pay for those. We found out who does the signs. Who does the Science Bureau? We have a guy from the industry that was doing a meeting, and the, the new, the Brooklyn PA people asked for their signs. We don't handle that, CAB handles that. So this isn't a local group that spent 10 or 15,000 bucks on signs. There were hundreds of them all down 29. This is an ad they put in the local paper that has 10 business names underneath it, local businesses. No water line for you scumbags. 
Come on, guys. That took two years. This happened in 2010. The problems have started in 2008. Want to hear even funner? When the Manning's water went bad and was found out on December uh, 6, 2011, but they didn't come forward until March of 2012, just a year ago. When they came forward, oh boy, I would have thought, we're all going to hug and kumbaya around them and help them out, aren't we? No. We start Franklin Citizens for Truth. What that means? We got letters that call them lunatics. They're going to ruin it for all of us. The companies are going to leave. <laughs> I don't like that. I said, what are you, what are you doing? Saddest day so far in over three years of being there. Vera, Vera was there too. We both spoke at it. The water was bad and dead, we all knew. We're supposed to get the pipeline, that's gone. And on November 30th of 2011, the governor of the state of Pennsylvania and the DEP said, Kevin can stop delivering water to the 11 families that are getting water. Stop deliveries. Is the water fixed? No. no. We're just embarrassed that they have to keep delivering. So a month and a half before that, he made the announcement they were going to do it on November 30th. So Craig Stockner, who I was traveling around with talking to people about what was going on, every day at work he'd spend a minute and he'd call the governor's office, Secretary Cranster, the Scott Perry's office, and say, hey, you guys are stopping water deliveries, but my water's so bad. What am I supposed to tell my family? What are you going to do for us? Because you're the ones that signed all the drilling permits to allow them to come and do it. Then you hang up the phone, no foul language, no threats, no anything. just wants to know what he's supposed to do. He did that for 30 straight days. And then I was at his house, we came home from an event, and the message machine was flashing, so he punched the button in front of all of us and said, this message is for Craig Sautner, this is the State Capitol Police in Harrisburg, you're being warned, one more call to the governor's office or to the secretary of transfer's office, and we'll have you arrested. Okay. They're in Harrisburg, which is a three-hour drive away from us. And the state capitol police have no authority outside of the state capitol. Threatening <coughs> a citizen with arrest because he doesn't know what he's going to do for water for his family. We get to November 30th and there's no answer. There's no more water coming. And we're like, what do we do? So what do I do? I dropped a dime to Matt Ryan, the mayor of England. If you don't know, that's the largest city in the southern tier. 55,000 people in our area of the southern tier, 55,000 people. That's more than we have in our entire county population. And I had met Matt at a DC hearing. He seemed like a nice guy. And he said, hey, Matt, we, we need some help, man. You got anybody that can get a water tanker to us to help get some people some water? He said, let me see what I can do. Then he called me back and said, right, we got a tanker. We had just winterized it. We'll all winterize it. We'll get it full of water. All I have to do is call the supervisors at Demick and get a, a, a mutual aid agreement. Which is what you have to do when you're giving aid to another town or another county or another state, like in an emergency. So Matt calls them up and they say, here's a quote. Vitbur is really bad if we didn't accept free water from you, right? And Matt goes, doesn't matter how it looks, I'm willing to bring water for no charge. I just have to have you sign this. Well, then we have to run by our, our solicitor, our attorney. That was on, uh, he called on Wednesday night, the 30th. The next day was the 1st of... Uh, December, no answer. So we called him back. No, he's out of, he's hunting. Tomorrow we'll talk to him. Friday, they still won't. We, we did find out on Friday morning when the neighbors, the, the contaminated water, were driving by the Devon Township building. 50 vehicles out front and a lot of trucks. So one of them pulled in and opened the door. There's the three supervisors sitting there without announcing a meeting. You can't have two supervisors together when you only have three, or that breaks the Sunshine Act. They're in there, and who's in there with them? All the cabin guys. <coughs> not going to get water to these people. Okay. So that's on a Friday. Guess when they're the next following Monday night was the 6th, I think it was 5th, was their township meeting. So Vera and I went with a bunch of people. We got there. Well, they cleared out all the vehicles from their warehouse. And 250 people were in that room. And I, I got five news crews there. Thank God, because Vera and I were pretty sure if we didn't have the news agencies there to film it, we would have been hanging from the rafters of the building. No kidding. It was that contentious. 
There was about 30 people that were back the people with the bad water, and about 220 people that were viciously angry at them for even having the audacity to even ask to bring water to somebody. Well, Matt showed up, and you know what he got? Shouted out of the building. He tried to talk, they shouted him down, told him, go back to Binghamton, we don't want you here. To try to bring water for free to people. So he looked at the supervisors and said, I don't need to do this. I'm the mayor of Binghamton in New York. I'm just asking, are you going to do it? Are you going to take care of your own citizens here that have problems with their water? No, we're not. They said, well, we're afraid that if we, they take that, that there could be a lawsuit if the water is contaminated. He said, no, my lawyer already drafted something, and the people have all agreed they won't sue us if there's a problem because we're trying to do this to help. So all that had been taken care of by the attorneys. So he said, really, what kind of a lawsuit do you think you're going to get in for not allowing water to go to these people if you, they find out they got sick from drinking the water or having contact with the water that's already there. It's true. What kind of lawsuit you have then? So why I speak is I don't understand why <clears throat> everyone's at each other's throat. I know they want to make money. I know they picked a company to come. I know the company is drilling in the area and they're in a pooling unit. They're going to get some money. That's perfect. But I don't know about you guys. But I'm not reaching in my chest and pulling my soul out from these guys. Not doing it. Not for sale. And I'm hoping there's people in this room that, 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 that can hear that, hear me saying that. My soul is not for sale. I'll take money if you owe me money for my minerals. But I'm not turning my back on my neighbors. I'm not turning my back on my family members. I'm not turning my back on the people I go to school with. I'm not even from there. And I'm trying to stand up for these people. But there are people that have been in our, that valley for nine generations. And they're doing this. Turn their back on them. Turn their back on your neighbors. Matt and Tam, you're down there. The nicest people we've ever met with Franklin Citizens for Truth. Tell them liars and lunatics. I've never seen anything like it. It's not the fraction of the ground I'm worried about and the extraction of natural gas. It's the fraction of the community. As contentious as it is right now, with some people wanting it, and some people feel like other people are trying to tell them what they can or can't do, wait till it shows up. It's a hundred times worse, a thousand times worse when the money starts getting built out. Oh yeah, they donated, they helped raise $4.4 million for our new hospital, cabinet. And they bought the van that's at our library to take the, the bookmobile. And that's got cabinet gas on it. And we, every year we have this really cool chocolate wine festival. Now it's called the Chocolate Wine and Oil and Gas Festival. Because the first top five donors, sponsors are, you know, Cabot, Williams, Carrizo, all the drilling companies. They buy everything. I'm not kidding. They will. And, you know, I want, they got money to donate to the hospital, millions, but they can't fix somebody's water when they've been found guilty to do it. That's all I'm expecting, guys. I'm not demonizing the whole industry. It, would you all learn growing up? If you break it, you gotta fix it. If you can't fix it, you gotta buy it. Oh, okay, that's simple. If you're breaking it, fix it. Here's what the pad answer is. Drill holes in the area. 2,000 feet away, 3,000, 4,000. Matt and Tammy are between four and 7,000 feet from the two closest wells. 4,000 at the hall bed, 7,000 at the pews. They're right here. That's a long ways away. That's over a mile in one direction. So what the pad answer is from the industry is, oh, we didn't do that. That was pre-existing. That was from the flood. That was from Salt Springs Park that migrated over. That was from, and I was expecting to hear the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny, and Santa Claus. You almost expect to hear that coming out of the mouth. And then what's really interesting at the Mannings was, when the water was bad, the and I got the ball, four months in, no water, no buffaloes, no vet stacks. Beer and I found out about it, and we like to stand for the neighbors, so we went down there. How's it working out for you staying quiet? It's not working. You got there. If you Google the Manning's water well, it was shooting water out. It was good. Every, every few hours, it would build up pressure, and it would look like an eruption shooting water about 20 feet of the sides, just shooting it out from the high pressure of the methane underneath it. And we showed up. Do you like living like this? No. Why are you staying quiet? The lawyer said to stay quiet. Is it quite working out for you? Want to go out? Yeah. Five new shooters in their front lawn the next day. Because you know what they don't like? They like all the PR. They paid $180 million last year for PR. 
the United States, the industry did. You know what they don't like? A camera in front of them asking the neighbor, and when your water went black four months ago, and now your water's bad, and you've got four generations living in the house, and your granddaughter's getting up every morning uh, vomiting when she wakes up from sleep, because she's up above the sink where you're leaving and running all the time and not so the water won't go like that out in your so you're leaving them. So we asked them, are you, are you gonna get the water buffaloes like the like cattle did in the dead? Like immediately got people disconnected. No, the DP didn't tell us we have to do it. So there's the DP. So DP, you gonna you know, you're gonna ask them to do it or order them to do it? No, we're we're still determining what's going on. You know, we're only four months into the investigation. We're like, what in that? So I got home and I was very frustrated. So I went all um, first responder on. I called Pima, Pennsylvania Emergency Management. Just so happens, the Manning's house is here. Here's their water well. 50 feet away is a major state route, north and south, Route 29. And you got methane coming out at 86 milligrams per liter. Can't even light it on fire. You have to have 15% methane and 85% oxygen to light it on fire. You're at 86 milligrams per liter. It's saturated. You can't light it. But when it floats from the wellhead over near the road, it might be a little more closer to 85, 15, then somebody tosses a cigarette one out, and then the whole neighborhood goes kablam, kablam, right? So I call Pet Pima and say, I'm de they said, how can we help you? It's Pima, Pennsylvania Emergency Management. I'm declaring an emergency methane explosion hazard on Route 29 in Franklin Fort, Pennsylvania. She said, what? I repeated it. Huh? She transfers me. I'm talking to Bob Full director of the Pennsylvania Emergency Management five seconds later. Then he made they called me back with a beeping line. I had to say the same thing, so I'm not making a false report. And then when I talked to him again, he said, this is not happening. Well, I explained to him what was going on. He got off the phone, called the head of DDP, Mike Cranzer, and the next day, what were they installing at the houses? Man, I was in water in my floors. But Vera and I had to step in and do it. Otherwise, Matt and Tammy are pretty sure they'd be living the same way for 15 months. And guess what they just decided on Saturday? Their determined nation letter from the DEP. I have it right here. Guess what the DEP said? Anybody want to take a wild guess? They're not responsible. For <laughs> nothing, nothing related to the drilling. <laughs> What's wrong with your water? You're like, okay. But it doesn't say what did it. Got the whole letter. The, the, the letters are interesting. You watch the press release, talks about the park, and the, got the same methane, and the same barium, and the same high above the levels of acceptable by law are a mile down the way to the park. And that's the same as we're finding it yours, so they're related. But it wasn't the drilling. It happened right up in Shelly Depew's property above the park, or by you. So we're, Vera and I are taking umbrage to it. And if you don't know what umbrage means, umbrage means you're not buying their story. <laughs> So we're challenging it. We're saying if you found the same problems at Salt Spring Park and the same problems a mile away at Franklin Forks, then what caused the water at the park to change? Right? That's the key to this. Is it's like a, it's like you have to search for the answers. They don't give the answers. So we're getting tired of it. You're not are. So we're starting to do right to know. We're like the right to know champions. We're right to know, right to know, right to know, right to know. And then they send, oh, you owe us 50 bucks for this right to know because it's 100 pages. And you owe us, I mean, they, they, they nickel and dime and want to charge you and tell you. Then I did, I, I did a broad scope one. They sent me a $1,000 bill if I wanted to get it. They said, we're not even going to start retiring unless you want to pay us a grant. Oh, let me, let me tailor that a little bit closer to, you know, 50 bucks or 25 bucks or something. So in order for us to do our job as citizens, because that's what your job is, how does an emergency responder show up at your uh, neighbor's house if it's on fire if they're on vacation? You, when you make the call, hey, my neighbor's house is on fire and I know they're gone. Can you get over there? So somebody has to call and alert them. Not like they're sitting at the station and they go, 10 miles away, think somebody's house is on fire. They don't do that. Right? Or call the cops, somebody's breaking in. Somebody's got to make a call. That's our job as citizens, guys. We're the ones that are supposed to make the call. We're supposed to say, eh, I'm seeing a problem, and dial up. You know how they treat us, the, our own state agency? Hang up on you. I mean, I've never seen anything like it before. 
Guess, now, the, I told you the three of your state senators came to visit, and they visited the Mannings, and we took them over to Demick, and we showed them the roads. By the way, I'm a big red Durango, and boy, we were doing the deed on the roads, and the senators were going, we're, we're, all we're being told in the Capitol in Albany is how great the roads are here. And Senator Perkins is like, I think I'm going to be bleeding when I go to the bathroom from the kidney damage from these, you know, from bouncing me around. I was trying to take them around the holes. It's that bad. You're not going to chunks out of the roads and stuff. They're not doing anything with the roads. They only fix the roads when they have to to drive their trucks on it. Otherwise, they don't care about what we're doing or, or the school buses or anything else. That's the key. Farmers. Anybody in here a farmer? Anyone or know a farmer? Here's PASA. Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, 6,000 members in Pennsylvania. I'm going to read you. Statement on unconventional natural gas extraction, adopted June 11, 2012, last year. PASA asserts its position in the favor of a moratorium on unconventional gas extraction. Until it is determined that this practice will not impair the ability of farms to profitably produce healthy food while respecting Pennsylvania's air quality, water resources, and natural environment. End of story. That represents 6,000 sustainable agriculture farmers in Pennsylvania. They're not stupid. They, look, they did the math. Here's what I think they should do. Anybody know when they do big projects to build like in Ithaca or around, they do a surety bond. They have to put a hundred million buck bond up to five hundred million to do a road. They've got to put a ton of money in. Number one, so they don't walk away without finishing it. Because then the money is there to finish the project if they run out of money or the bankrupt. Number two is, if they do something wrong, they got to pay for it. So why wouldn't the industry be OK with a surety bond? Because they don't have to put all the money up. They won't put 10% up. Pennsylvania, how about a trillion dollar surety bond and it's shared amongst all the drillers, depending on their size and percentage of the marketplace in Pennsylvania. So they all pitch in. You know why they wouldn't be able to get one? Anybody got a guess? Because somebody has to review that. The like Lloyds of London, where are we going to get the surety bond from? And once they research this stuff, they go, <laughs> are you kidding me? I'm putting a dime up against this stuff. Anybody, somebody here, ever, anybody here buy a share of stock before from any of the companies? Yeah. What did you get when, when they, before they sent you the share of stock? You get the disclaimer. You get the sheet that you have to sign. Usually it's two or three pages. And it tells you all the potential negatives and why you might lose your investment. Your 50 bucks, your 35 bucks or whatever. There might be explosions, environmental hazards, deaths, all this stuff. I mean, it's like a, so I'm thinking, wait a minute. So I buy a share of stock, and you have to, by law, you have to inform me that there are risks to this activity. And I can lose all my money. And the company can go bankrupt. And then you go to the landowner. Who has the lease again? Did any of the leaseholders, did any of the leaseholders uh, get more? Anything about that? No, they did not. The guy that's given up the property with them. So I'm wondering how disingenuous that is. So that's the key. Why would they tell somebody that pays 50 bucks for a share of stock or something, but they won't land it? I think the commercials now should be all the great stuff about it until the very end, and just like a pharmaceutical commercial. And then the last 10 seconds, the guy that talks really fast. <coughs> right? He tells you all the bad stuff that can happen. So we get both sides. We're really fast for the last 10 seconds. I'm going to wrap it up in a minute. What I want to do is, number one, I've got Vera here, is here with me, but I want to bring up um, a friend of mine that I met last year in Bath when I spoke, but I just saw him again in Elmira the other night, and uh, I didn't know him, but he saw me speak, and after he saw me speak, he decided that he needed to speak up, um, and I'm going to have him up here for the question and answer, too. His name is Lee McCaslin, Robert Lee McCaslin, right, but he called himself Lee. And Lee is from the Bath area, and uh, he's been in the working in the drilling industry since 1979. I'd like to have him come up. The reason is my credibility is nothing except for a landowner with finding these problems. But his credibility, when we go to question and answer, is going to be very interesting. I learned a lot the other night when I listened to him and the other people, because some of these guys are coming forward. You know why? Not because it's easy, but because they are listening. And they're seeing the problems, and they're seeing that the industry, even since 1979, hasn't learned how to take care of the community that they're in. They say they're all for us in our community, and they're going to help us and build hospitals and everything else. 
but they won't stand up for the people in the community that are having problems. And I thought that's what we came for, is to help all of us do better, not just a couple of us do better and everybody else can uh, <coughs> leave the year. Um, Lee, come on up if you can. And uh, I'm going to have him speak just for a few more minutes, just introduce himself and tell me what he's about and what he's doing, and then we're going to open it up, I believe, to let you guys ask questions so we can get some things checked out. Great. Uh, my name is Lee Kasman, builder, like you said, 1979 when I started out in Fairfield, Illinois. And uh, I guess I want to share what I'm hearing here exactly, you know, and, and the difference between the paths and stuff like that. I want to go to the mechanics of, of what happens after you lease the land, very basically. And that's uh, like in Canada, they, uh, they buy the leaves, we come in and drill, basically. And uh, I thought, what an industry. What an industry. And it, it's, uh, I brought some things that I was pretty well proud of. Wild Bug Control. They teach you how to fire fight the rig fires. Also some full pictures. Back in the drill days. <clears throat> My master diploma, 2005. When just before this was going on in Pennsylvania, I uh, worked in Garfield County from 2000, 2002 to 2008. I uh, did pad jobs. Uh, 10, 10 in a row, 50 foot apart, which was called s -walks. And we'd drill down, we'd kick off, and, and uh, so on and so forth, you know, pad jobs. And the mechanical part of it, you just, you live your life, you know, you work your seven days on, seven days off, and, and uh, you take care of your crew. Well, your crew now happens to be the people. The people here are the crew. Because it's a real dirty industry. I start contamin from the, contaminating your ground or anybody that pieces me ground from the time I spot it, from the time my trucks come and set up to start drilling. That's when I start contaminating. Through the grilling mud, through the uh, grow process I can take you through. Working underneath the mud engineer for several years, that's a dairy can spot, and that's my favorite spot. The, 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 when you become the driller, then it's your responsibility to watch over everybody on the location, on your tower. These guys ain't watching over nobody on the tower. You know, besides the men that we work with. They're our new family. I work, you know, those are my hands and <coughs> that's my family while I'm at work. And then while I'm at home, my other family, you see where I'm going? There's 14 days that just spend on tower and then there's 14 days that just stay at home. You know, more than <coughs> seven days of sleep. Three days of travel. So you look at me. But the mechanics part of it, it's a nasty industry. I had some motor hands and some dairy cans and quite a few people that I knew from Colorado come into Pennsylvania. I uh, went to uh, Kildare, North Dakota, and I was working up there from 2009 to 2010. I threw in the towel. Time to quit. You know, time to look around. Time to settle down, I guess you'd say. Settle down, share the uh, knowledge and the information that, that people that are not in the industry should know about. 
far as any of these wells going by, you know, that well, as soon as it's on that pad, depending on who you got working for you, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of like a whole, whole new, different monster. <laughs> brought some pictures and I got a whole bunch of stuff but but those hands I used to take care of a lot. Now where do I want to um, take this industry to? Well I don't want to take it nowhere because all it is is a big shell game. Yes. Somebody gets hurt, covers up, goes away. Somebody burns down a rig, happens, goes away. If you want to look up some rig accidents, look up Cyclone. Cyclone's probably the most <coughs> fierce bandit out there. But uh, they burnt down three rigs in the valley where I was working. Did they come to Pennsylvania? I know that you, uh, Enzyme US building was here. I know. Uh, you know, so they're only a contractor. You guys are the leaseholders, or the leaseholders will uh, get it to uh, Incana, Chevron, Shell. There's, there's not a part of this that are safe. Even if we go to single derricks, you know, and the brand new conversion rates, it's still your mud. Everything that uh, you mix in your chemicals goes down the hole. Hit your aquifer. It's already contaminated. When uh, when I broke out, it was kind of like to get this job that I had. You had to wait until the guy died. That's how much he loved that break out. <laughs> That's why they call him a goat because that was his job. So, you know, footage. I'm a down hole man. I like to know what's down the hole. A lot of footy chants out there that just ran and ran. That's wildcat. Technology today is um, your pesans and you know, it's a whole different uh, beast. Even uh, the little town, let me, let me share a little bit of my life, I guess. A little bit of my life, like I said, 79 broke out, um, full of casing. Uh, my first call that I dug was Kimberly Allen. That was a very young person. I spent my 18th birthday on that, on that rig. Come home, I was thousand dollars in '79 and '80 was big dollars. You know, that was my hand paid. And uh, these guys that came in from Vietnam, they, they uh, actually how I got my my spot on that rig was I was working for Carter and Barry. And the dairy can, he's always got a poofed up chest and he thinks he's bigger than he really is. Well, I was in wrestling that year and uh, I took him. I took him down. So a few months later, he called my mom and then my mom told him that I was in Illinois full of casing. So he says, right up our alley. So they shipped me out there to Wyoming. I spent a week in each position. And then I, I made it to the dairies where you take care of all your mud and your chemicals and all that in the industry. And then I come down and run that break in because these guys broke me out that way. And then, then, uh, then came the bus, you know, it went up with you. There wasn't a job to be had. So I went back home to my hometown, which is in uh, Mansalona. And you'll see it on some of these uh, some of these uh, slides now today, and it's the antrum shell. <coughs> and when they come in to do the antrum shell, you know it's not very deep, maybe 1,200 feet. But what they were doing was they were taking old work over rigs, any kind of piece of garbage that they could put together, combine it, put it all together, and then drag it, drill one hole, drag it another hole and continue that. And, and, and it was it just for the whole county. And uh, we had big potato farmers <coughs> out there. Now they're all shut in. By shut in I mean there's no 
more activity. You got a wellhead out here, that in the morning the gas is set slow. You know, so all those potato fields, kitchens, potato fields, are now shut down. You know, they're shut in. Well, now we're going to pay not to farm them no more. You know, and uh, so you start seeing all these different things happening where I've been. You know. And uh, Garfield County, it's right on the Colorado River. Williams has got a plant here, um, and Ken has got a plant. Uh, I do a lot of PDC and Chevron. But up in that canyon, all these holes are right on the Colorado River. And it says, whatever happens up river will soon be at the end of the river. And, uh, and when I first hit uh, Grand Junction back in back in the 80s, there's a little town called Clifton. Real small little town. I mean, uh, well, it's just just about the size of this place. But Grand Junction's right here. And there in the next boom in the 2000, you'd see that place expand to over 160,000 people oh, were all in there. They, they seen that explosion before in the 80s when the boom was born. And then what happened was they, they completely shut down so that town almost went belly up. And that's what's really great. Montrose, Montrose, Colorado is just beautiful. That's where I was before they moved back. Good place. Montrose is a good place too. Yeah. Now that they know the effects that started uh, to hit uh, Garfield County, we've got some protesters out there. Stop the drilling, you know. Wait a minute. Some pretty bad things are happening out there. And uh, been offshore for for Slumber Jay, 25 miles off in the Gulf. And if you ever get a chance to run a plane over there or uh, take a boat, it's just like an ocean city because that's exactly what it is. I mean, there's platforms right here. It's just like a city. Unbelievable, you know. That was back in, uh, back in the 90s. And then, uh, then my wife talked me out of uh, getting out. <laughs> so I'm going to break for in a minute for question and answer. Lee drove an hour and 15 minutes from Bath just to be here, and I called him today. I'm going to tell you. He has a story to tell, but he's available for the questions, and I wanted him here. He didn't have to come. I asked him. He said, we'll see. And it looks like that was good, but I'm going to get him out from people like yourselves that need to hear this story. Because he's not talking about it. He worked in the industry, made a living from it. And I'm sure he was happy to do that, but he's seen it all too. I'm going to end my portion and then open it up for questions with what I do every time. I like to read quotes. I, with what happened to Demick, Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. You and I don't have any friends where we live anymore. We thought we were standing up for our community. But what we're really doing is standing against them. But I will stand against the entire community by myself if I know one thing. But I'm in the right. And I'm in the right on this. And it will be proven. Um, the uh, Tread and Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. There's a way better than me. There's a good man standing right next to me because he's willing to talk about things that some other will do. And uh, Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Lee knows all about that. They're not, they're not getting any better at what they're doing. They're just getting it better covered up, it looks like. But he'll be able to do that. Um, I'll do one more Martin Luther King that I love. This is a brand new one. On some positions, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? 
But conscience asks the question, is it right? This is not right what they're doing. And they're not, uh, they're not impressing me at all. And I'll leave it since I'm buddies with uh, Wun Gandhi now. Um, I didn't know I would be. I don't think three years ago, most of the people that are helping us out would give me the time off their watch. I'm, I'm a crazy conservative in California. They respect Vera and I now because of what we're doing. We, they, Mark Ruffalo, we were at a, uh, last week, week and a half ago, we were in New York City at the Riverkeeper Hall. And, and uh, we were honored guests, Vera and myself, Mayor Matt Ryan. And when Mark Ruffalo got up, was the man here to speak. He asked for the three of us to stand up and said, we're on the front lines fighting this. I didn't go there to be acknowledged. We didn't even know we were going to be acknowledged. But this is the man of the year there, Mark Ruffalo, with a half an hour talk. And he, to him, he said, I play a superhero in the movies. There's some superheroes standing in this room, that are in this room and I want them to stand up. I'm not one, but I'll tell you, that lady sitting there behind that camera for She will go up against the roughnecks toe to toe, and they lose every single time. And I'm going to end with this. The greater the power, the more dangerous the abuse, is Sir Edmund Burke, let me get the, the Gandhi quote here. Earth provides enough for every man's need, but not every man's greed. Let that sink in for a minute. Nobody begrudges you having a good life and having all the things you dream of having. The only time it's a negative is when you're taking something away from somebody else to get it. So at this point, we've got about a half an hour left. So what I want to do is open it up. Um, and any questions you have, and please feel free to direct them to me because I'm, I've talked plenty here. If you have a specific for me about things, but anybody with a question, especially related to what's really going on, feel free to ask us. Go ahead. What kind of, have you seen illnesses and stuff while working on the rigs when you were doing it? I mean, what kind of hazards are these guys facing? You seem to look pretty healthy, but yet we hear about all the illnesses and things that are working on these types of well, industries. Most of them's just there, and it's kind of like a shell game because they're not going to tell you about that stuff. You know, I got MSDS sheets if you want to take a look. And all the, the hazard chemicals that are next in the compounds. Yeah, I'm pretty healthy because I like to keep that way. You know, keep physical thing.
resoundingly by more than two thirds. It's, it's a veto proof majority. Now it's in the Senate. So these senators have to make some pretty big decisions coming up. And sadly, I would say, being a conservative, the only ones that are really planning to become are the Democrats. And I have no problem with that. I think that's great. So I did a, an outreach to all Republicans, all your Republican senators. You've got one up here, O'Mara. You've got Libis down from here, I am. And I'm telling you, I'm getting contact back from them. They're going to come. You know why? Because right now the governor is, the assembly's clean, man. They said, forget it. You know, we want two more years. The governor, of course, is sitting in the middle, and the Senate now has it in their hands. They have some choices to make. So they're staying, they want to come. I don't care what they, we call it a bipartisan, nonpartisan tour. Vera, Vera and I are apart politically, but as human beings, we're right here together. That's the thing. They should all come. Making this important of a decision without seeing it in first in first person is ridiculous. That is another uh, um, ridiculous abuse of power to not come and see it. So you'll be happy to know I have up to 20 that have responded back to me that want to come and check it out. I think more will come because how would you like to stand on the Senate floor with 62 people, 63 people, and you start yapping about how we got to get the jobs here and all this, and then the other senator goes, hey, I've been there. Have you been there? <laughs> you say, no, I just heard Tom West from Chesapeake uh, you know, talk about it in my office when he was offered how much money he was going to get next year for re-election. That doesn't fly. Vera and I believe everyone should come and see it no matter what they think about it after. And Vera and I encourage them to go on rate tours, but they will never learn from a rate tour what we will show them. Because Lee knows. They shiny that rate tour up. It's all fun and put the hard hat on for the kids to go, wow, that's really exciting. Look how good it is. And they're guessing, hopefully, nothing goes wrong real bad when everyone's on that rate tour, which it doesn't. But I, I agree with you. We've invited all of them. I personally went to Albany for two straight days and went to every office of every center. Why? They're drilling the hell out of us in Pennsylvania. Why did Craig go to New York? Because in New York, we can make a difference right now. Because you guys are smart enough. Whether you're on one side or the other on this, you're smart enough to step back and go, hey, what's going on right down there? It just took us an hour and a half, hour and 45 to get from here down to our house. It's not very far away. I recommend all of you come down and see what's happening in person. It'll change your gray ball came to us a year and a half ago. Right wing Tea Party conservative, drill baby drill, he said. And unless we show him something really scary, he's going to go back to New York and say, let's get this going. <coughs> and two hours later, I mean, he had tears coming out of his eyes from listening to the stories of people who lived in the and gave him the documents. We saw that guy, that hard of a position, change like that. I simply show it to them so we knew. This is why people like Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono and Mark Ruffalo and Bobby Kennedy, even if you don't agree with them politically, by the way, on most things I don't, but at least they showed up and took an interest in finding out what's going on. That impresses me. That's what I want to see from people, is they want to come and learn about it when they have a position from a position of knowledge, not a position of ignorance. Go ahead. Uh, I understand that you were in a local meeting, the last local meeting, here in Yes. And we have a very uh, strong opposition, and trying we're trying to pass a ban here. Sure. So having been at this other meeting, which I wasn't at, I wasn't in the country, but what do you suggest is a practical approach for us here? Because you can see who turned out. Right. Where are our elected officials? Where is our town right. war? Right. We can point the finger to the politicians in Albany. What about the local politicians? How do we get through to them now before we have a scenario like you're describing? Chloroform and a van with blacked out windows. You're going to have to take, you're going to have to drag it down. I don't care what the threat has to be, but not against them personally. But what? In other words, election day. Election day. <laughs> you have to bring them to see it. You have to see what is really happening. Because when they see it, all the things are being told, and, and that, that assembly, people have to show up at the meetings. Vera and I go up county commissioners' meetings. We're the only ones that step up and talk about this at every meeting. They're like, oh, here they go again. 
<laughs> and then Vera films it. Then we show up the Silver Lake Township meetings, and 99% of the people in Silver Lake Township would love us to die horribly in a fiery car crash. I'm not kidding you. They would like us gone. Leave. You're not from here. Go away. I mean, that's the key. You have to stand up against it. Um, tyranny in any form, you have to stand up against it. It doesn't matter if it's one person, whatever. But I would recommend to keep putting the pressure on and saying, you know what? The senators are going, and they're probably a little bit more powerful than anybody sitting in this room. But I'm recommending we all go. Take a group, including all of them, and everybody come down to see both sides and let them see what's going on. We can't even get them to come to see you. I got it. One was here. One was here. Go ahead.